Um, I'm Ellen Collada, uh, and I will moderate the second panel, uh, which follows on the first panel, obviously, that had a very synthetic overview of Cuba, uh, uh, US uh, scholarly and political relationships. And this panel will be directed more towards the academic exchange, the actual experiences of my colleagues here on, on the uh, podium. Um, my own uh, connection to Cuba is actually both personal and professional, although fairly tangential. The personal connection is, uh, comes through my godchild, uh, who is a, a Aymara, uh, member of the Aymara community uh, in Bolivia, who in fact went to Cuba, trained, of course, by Cubans to become a physician. Uh, he has been uh, trained uh, in Cuba for the last eight years uh, and has now returned to Bolivia, and he's a practicing physician in Aymara communities in the area of Lake Titicaca. Uh, so I have supported his, uh, his uh, work in Cuba, uh, although indirectly, of course, uh, flowing to his parents uh, in, in La Paz. So that's my personal connection. The professional connection I have to Cuba was as an administrator of the Center for Latin American Studies here in what has been referred to a couple of times uh, as the golden era. Uh, that is, in my case, uh, I was director from 1994 to 1998 when the University of Chicago did enjoy substantial support, uh, financial support from the MacArthur Foundation. Of course, Ford Foundation and MacArthur were two principal uh, fun private foundations supporting uh, Cuba uh, US uh, scholarly exchanges, and we enjoyed that for a number of years. Uh, and although that grant, obviously, we no longer do enjoy, nevertheless, uh, there is still a flow. There is still a flow of scholars from the University of Chicago, albeit much more difficult, as has been made painfully clear here uh, over the course, uh, a continued flow and an interest. And that uh, the, the three P's mentioned, I think, is shared by all of the people on the stage, that is persistence and patience, and most especially passion. And so I won't go on any farther other than to introduce, I guess, from left to right, uh, our other panelists here, all of whom, except for Agnes, are anthrop practicing anthropologists, but so you feel very comfortable among anthropologists uh, in any event. I go native. Yes. <laughs> on, the, on the far left over here, Laurie Frederick, uh, who is uh, now at, affiliated uh, with the University of Maryland in performance studies and is an anthropologist from the University of Chicago, has her degree here and did uh, substantial work in that golden era in Cuba. Uh, Stefan Palmier uh, in the Department of Anthropology as well, faculty member. Paul Ryer, uh, again, a, a, a former, now former graduate student uh, from the University of Chicago, Department of Anthropology, done substantial work in Cuba and is now at Mount Holyoke. And then, of course, Agnes Lugo Ortiz, who needs no uh, introduction. So, uh, <laughs> so I think what we're going to do, uh, given the time, um, I, my role here is to be tough and basically to uh, have everyone uh, recount their experiences of their work in, uh, in Cuba, one way or another, their, uh, the logistics, the, the prospects, uh, the outcomes. And um, I have no particular order in mind, but I suppose we can start over here. Everyone, the panelists will speak for about uh, five minutes to seven minutes, and, and then hopefully we'll open it up for a broad discussion after we do that. So we're here. Okay. Um... My research in Cuba went from, it started in 1997, as um, talking about this was when we were getting a lot of funding into Center for Latin American Studies, and I was very lucky in that capacity. Um, the U.S. license, we did not have an institutional license at that point, so that was really the, the stickler, was getting a license. And all of us, I think, have gone through the application process for individual licenses. So with the institutional license, that made life a lot easier on this end. And I think, when I think about um, doing research in Cuba, there's, there's different elements of it. The first, of course, is, is getting the funding and getting your license on the U.S. side. The second, then, is getting the affiliation and the visa on the Cuban side, which is, I think, probably a lot more difficult, um, depending on where you want to work, than getting the license. It's a lot less straightforward, and as was, was referred to earlier, it's very unpredictable. My research was I did one year in, I worked in Havana off and off a lot, um, off and on. And I did one year in Cumaniagua and in the, the mountains of this Cambrai region, which is on the cusp of kind of San Fuegos and Via Clara, in that central region there. Um, I worked with a theater group and performers who, who did their work with the campesinos in these rural areas. My second year, which by the way was under a Fulbright haze, so it was federal money that gave, I'm not sure if they still give money. <laughs> 
Um, I got one, luckily, that year, and that was in Guantanamo, rural Guantanamo. So I was working in base with artists in Guantanamo City and then traveling up into the, what they call the Zonas de Silencia. So these areas where there's no electricity and no um, communication, working with the campesinos there as well. So my next challenge is then, as um, Lou Perez was talking about, his student was working in these rural areas, which are very, very separated in, in all sorts of capacities from Havana. And certainly a letter with a stamp is going to do you no good unless you know the guy who has the key to the archives and your friends. And there's networking that, there's a lot of networking and a lot of pre-research um, set up work that has to be done in order to work in these places. I was very lucky in terms of my visa. I was affiliated with the Centro de Investigación de Arias which is um, one of the Center for Investigations that are very um, rampant throughout Cuba, mostly based in Havana. That group was a group of sociologists, historians, um, writers, and teatristas, people who did scientific, social scientific research on the theater. So I was very lucky to meet with these people and they supported me and affiliated me and allowed me to go out to wherever I wanted to go, which is not the usual case. I think the restrictions are becoming more and more. So they allowed me to basically just check in with them whenever I was back in Havana and I would get papers at their panels periodically and get feedback and it was a wonderful relationship. When I went into Guantanamo and Escambray, I always had to have letters. I had to have letters from the Consejo de Artes Escénicas, which is the National Theatre Board, and the Center for Investigations, and a letter from the mayor of the town, and I had to carry these documents with me. Um, I was never asked for them, but I had to have them, and so these are things, you know, although people, the, the letter with the stamp may or may not get you to the archives, it is important to have them once you get past whatever barrier you're trying to get past. So, my experience is very much in, in the countryside and working in areas where there is no tourism infrastructure. And this has all a whole other set of um, very you know, basic logistical um, obstacles as, tra as the travel and getting to places and um, establishing trust with people that wouldn't otherwise know you. So basically I did six months of preliminary field work and three separate trips before I then started a two-year stint um, down in Cuba, and that was, I found essential. I don't think there's any way I could have done my research without doing that kind of preliminary work, which not everybody is able to do, obviously. Um, so, on the other end then, after you have the U.S. license and the visa and doing your field work in, in these places that may or may not have an infrastructure, coming back to the United States, I've had various experiences going through the red line. Um, in 2006, I was labeled a potential terrorist and question for about a half hour. So I think all of us have, we all share stories as to what it means, not even getting into Cuba and doing work, but what happens then when we come back. Um, and if you have a license, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get hassled. So I see, I see Cuban research in these four stages, and if anybody has questions, everybody probably has similar stories about the one, two, and four, um, and then my particular expertise would be in the countryside and doing research in non, um, urban, central urban areas such as Havana or Santiago de Cuba. Um, my name is Shannon Dottie, I'm the Department of Anthropology, just in case you forgot, because we're all Department of Anthropology until we get to the end. But um, I wanted to start with just a, a, a provocative statement, which is that uh, the embargo is working. Um, that is that people, ideas, and money are not flowing very freely or easily uh, between Cuba and the U.S. as it stands right now. Um, but, but perhaps because smuggling is one of the um, topics that I study in my own work in historical <coughs> anthropology and archaeology, um, I'm also tempted to point at, uh, at ways in which things are flowing or can flow illicitly, uh, but I can't really do that in this um, setting. Uh, first, because I get in trouble um, to do it uh, on the record. So like many of my Cuban friends, I will talk to you um, off the record uh, at some time when, uh, over a mojito. Uh, secondly, uh, because promoting uh, alternative circuits um, does not attack the defensive walls of the blockade itself, um, I don't know that uh, I want to dwell on this for too long uh, in terms of going around it and how to do research now uh, under our present conditions. It would merely prolong this 45-year-old um, um, uh, insanity, uh, this siege, and it supports the amazing cognitive hypocrisy of the policy, which I think has been um, pointed out very well today, 
that, you know, in the face of it, this policy flies uh, in the, with, with just at utterly cognitive distance. It flies in the face of three, you know, erstwhile uh, American values, right? Freedom of speech, uh, democracy as indexed by the freedom of movement of citizens, uh, and that perhaps most questionable American value, uh, for some of us anyway, free trade. Right? Uh, and that's one thing that wasn't mentioned in the uh, earlier discussion that I wanted to kind of put on the table to talk about is one sort of unnatural uh, marriage might be, um, Laurie had brought up, uh, the possibility of really joining uh, you know, academic interests in free and travel to Cuba uh, with more general American interests. And there's one that might actually touch a lot of people besides um, college students wanting another place to vacation. Uh, it's trade, it's money, it's uh, market, right? And, and in fact, some of the congressmen who have been active in some of these other legislative acts are representing Midwest agricultural interests, looking for an opening. Uh, that's been going on for about 10 years, these legislative efforts. So that might be an, an, an unholy union you might want to think about. Um, academic freedom and, and capital uh, could be actually quite powerful if they were brought together. Um, and maybe we should have a discussion of how comfortable we are uh, with that. Uh, that it would be a very pragmatic, um, Clinton-esque way of approaching the uh, present conditions. Uh, just a little bit of background on, on me um, and my relationship to Cuba. Um, at the University of Michigan, I uh, went under an amazing patron. Talk about the patronage system. There's also that, and in the, in the, uh, it has to be that. I'm sure Luke can speak to this. In terms of uh, mentors taking graduate students to Cuba, you have to have your, your patron and my patron, my patron saint is Rebecca Scott, a historian who's been going there since the um, early to mid-1970s. And so I worked in Cuba, um, in, again, that golden age of 1998 to 1999, um, interviewing and getting to know um, Cuban archaeologists, uh, but also doing a work in the archives in San Fuegos and Havana. And I also um, did a little bit of ethnoarchaeology with a small family in the countryside outside of San Francisco, underneath the radar, um, to some extent. I also have some experience in academic exchange coming this way. Um, as a result of the contacts I made in Cuba, um, one of the things that really struck me when I was talking to folks was how hungry they were for dialogue and how much they wanted to know what was happening in the field outside of Cuba, because that part of the embargo is an embargo of information. Um, journals, uh, academic journals have a hard time, even in the electronic age, of reaching Cuba. Uh, and just the flow of information is often stunning. So I invited uh, a number of senior um, archaeologists uh, uh, working in Cuba at the time to the Society of American Archaeology meetings in 2002 in in Cuba, and I actually applied to the program and got funding from the program that Luke was talking about with SSRC, uh, and um, and it was a very successful panel, and it led to an edited volume, um, co-edited with, with one of our um, Cuban colleagues, uh, Antonio Curet. Uh, now, interestingly, the publication of that book, uh, just the, the ways in which the embargo works is just amazing madness. But the publication of that book was held up for six months while a court case was pending about whether or not um, having a Cuban author in an American published um, book uh, constituted, and I can't exact, I don't remember exactly what clause it violates of the law, but the idea was that this was material support uh, to, to Cuba. Um, so pending that case, our manuscript is held up, and finally that case got shut down and got um, pulled through, and actually the publishers have been very active in terms of this um, freedom, freedom of press and freedom of expression. Um, but it's been an education to, to watch that. Now since 2002, uh, I have certainly sensed a radical shift in the possibilities of Cubans coming to um, U.S. waters. And the next um, Society for American Archaeology meeting was held, held in Puerto Rico uh, last year in 2006. And my colleague at the Field Museum, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, Antonio Curet, um, he co-organized, or he had helped me uh, create an edit volume out of the first session in 2002, and he wanted to do this follow-up session with younger scholars um, and getting them to Puerto Rico, and we thought everything was fine. Uh, they were given permission from Cuba for young, to go to uh, Puerto Rico for the conference for another panel, uh, which, by the way, you should know that for um, Cuba, the senior scholars, it, it, can get cleared pretty easily. They're a little bit, a lot touchier about um, younger people going because they're considered a, um, you know, 
a, a flight risk, I guess you'd say. But what actually turned out happening is that uh, the U.S. denied the, the, all the visas across the board uh, for all six scholars uh, to go to Puerto Rico, and the session um, uh, had to be. We didn't cancel it. We sat and had a conversation about what's going on um, politically. Um, since then, uh, we also tried to, and this is at the same year, I think, that the LASA uh, conference also had full-scale denials of visas on the U.S. side. Uh, the um, Antonio Perret, the uh, my co-editor on the first volume we invited here uh, on a fellowship for a Tinker. He was awarded one of Tinker Fellowship where they are visiting um, faculty here for one quarter. And um, we were starting to move ahead with that. Um, Stephen Palmier was assisting me with that. And um, uh, Antonio decided to pull out because uh, as a result of investigations for visa approval for the Puerto Rico conference, his friends that he'd stayed with previously on numerous trips to Puerto Rico, a lot of these guys had been to Puerto Rico before, had uh, people coming door to door that uh, appeared to be FBI uh, who were investigating his friends and supporters, his friends and colleagues in Puerto Rico. And in his emails to us, he simply expressed, I don't want to put my family and my friends um, in any danger, so I'm going to decline this trip to the U.S. And we dropped the, um, the visa application at that time. And part of this was actually what precipitated the entire panel. It was, well, what do we do now? How do we bring attention to this problem? This is obviously a mounting um, uh, <coughs> issue. So. Okay, uh, I'm Stefan Palmier, um, and uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about you know what it is like for a non-citizen to go to Cuba in this country. I mean, I've uh, I tried to, uh, to go to Cuba the first time do ethnography there in uh, the mid-1980s, uh, when I was still in Germany. Uh, and I had my uh, proposal for a grant from the National German Research Foundation denied because of, I think, what was then probably still a very sensible argument, namely that it would be very hard to actually do ethnographic work without endangering one's informants. Because in the 19, you know, ever since uh, Oscar Lewis got kicked out, in uh, the early 1970s, there were, I mean, the, the, practically, a, you know, the Cubans put a stop to uh, ethnographic investigations on the, on the part of foreigners. And uh, one could actually sort of get people into trouble through what was called unrestricted contact with foreigners, which could lead to an accusation of ideological diversionism. So instead, I did my research, my, you know, from you know, where I eventually got my PhD. Uh, among Cubans in Miami on Afro-Cuban religion, which has continued to be my topic. And uh, the first time I actually did go to Cuba was after the beginning of the special period in 1991, when uh, you know, the country, of course, opened up to uh, increasingly to mass tourism. And, um, and with the exception of one single stay when I was sponsored by the Faculty of Philosophy and History uh, of the University of Miami in, 90, in the winter of 93, 94, I actually have been going there on tourist visa, which you know are extendable for up to three months. Flying, as you know, Shannon uh, put it, uh, more or less under the radar. And um, there is a way in which uh, you know ethnography can be done uh, to a certain extent, uh, very different from historical investigations or any. You know, if you need access to archives nowadays, you know, I, I did manage to get. Uh, access to a remarkable range of archives in the mid-1990s, but, uh, but that is no longer so. I, I just can't. And as far as ethnography is concerned, there still are uh, problems. And uh, one of them is that um, one could still endanger uh, one's informant. So there's an ethical question involved. Um, I mean, I remember um, coming, uh, that was the, probably the strangest trip that I ever took in terms of the getting in and out, because I flew, I was, in, hmm, I was in 2003, I think, I flew uh, from Canada because I uh, previously always gone from Miami, uh, but I flew from Canada and there uh, I arrived in Havana Airport and thought this was going to be a piece of cake and I was, uh, my, my luggage was searched. Not my luggage, that is, but my hand luggage, my briefcase. And they went through uh, you know, sort of several notebooks, uh, field notes that I had there, and I was really scared 
of what was going to happen there. Uh, in the end, it was fine. Uh, the same trip, I got picked up at a, uh, at an up, not picked up, but I, I, you know, I was confronted by the police at an Abakwa ceremony, which is a male secret society, which is under you know a considerable amount of government surveillance, and uh, and they also sort of uh, you know really felt bad afterwards. Uh, about my presence actually sort of potentially endangering people. And, uh, but what I was, you know, sort of, and then coming back, of course, uh, you know, I was traveling on a general license. Uh, the, legitimate, the legitimacy of my trip was questioned upon entry in Toronto already. So that was, you know, similar experiences. Lauren had, you know, sort of questioned for about 45 minutes. Uh, and then they told me, well, they were still not convinced about the legality of my trip. And I would be hearing from the Treasury Department, which I haven't done to the state. But uh, talking about the Treasury Department, you know, I just wanted to share a brief anecdote before I close about my first trip to Cuba from the United States in 1997. Because then I thought, you know, sort of, well, you know, I have my you know, sort of nice uh, European Community passport, and you know, I can basically just probably go. But I thought, well, maybe call up the Treasury Department, and at that time, one could actually still talk to the Office of Foreign Asset Control, uh, you know, via the telephone, which you can't anymore. And so I said to the person on, on the phone, you know, what I was doing, that I was, you know, going to do research in Cuba, and that uh, my understanding is that this is legal. And uh, and by the way, you know, sort of, I uh, am not a citizen of the United States, so is there any problem? And then the, the person said, well, look in your passport, don't you have uh, our visa stamped there? I then was on an H-1B visa at the University of Maryland, and said, yeah, of course. And then he said, well, then you're under our jurisdiction. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, if we catch you coming back from Cuba without a license, we will put you on the next available plane to where that passport says you're from. So basically, I mean, you know, informally threatened me with deportation, which uh, was, uh, you know, to say the least, an impressive experience. So, so you see, I mean, on, on both sides, uh, you know, sort of, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's bound up with all kinds of, you know, deeply troubling uh, questions. And, um, you know, I guess just, you know, if, I'll just leave it at that and maybe we can come back to some of these issues. Well, I feel like at this point I'm going to say a lot of the same things that other people have said, but uh, I, I am one of the uh, first, I guess one of the first beneficiaries of the Track 2 policy in the early golden, so-called golden age that uh, Lou Perez uh, referred to, uh, in that I was a graduate student here at the University of Chicago in the uh, mid-1990s and um, traveled to Cuba in 1994, was able to set up an affiliation and was it then able in 95 to get uh, uh, a couple of good research grants to go back for a, a year and a half uh, from 1995 through 97, part of, into 1997. Um, and as part of that whole process, um, I applied for a U.S. Uh, OFAC license. Um, up until then, it's my understanding that most OFAC licenses were given out for only a few weeks at a time, maybe a couple of months. And uh, so I think that there were some inconsistencies in the policy even then, even when it was relatively possible or feasible. And, and I think also maybe one sees some, something, a pattern where the first few years of any administration the policy is still kind of uh, uh, regulations and policies are being tightened or or changed slowly. Uh, the early early Clinton years weren't that different from the end of Bush administration. Track two really started rolling more in ninety four ninety five, and then the early Bush years, the early Bush the second, Bush the simple, I like to call it, but uh, uh, the the millennium still was relatively easy compared to what it's been in the last three or four years. So there's some, it, it seems like there's a, a, a pattern of, of a lag. But in any case, Clinton's track to fall of 95, I, 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 um, I got all the permissions, I had all the licenses and, together. And then I noticed just before I left, I noticed a problem. Not only was I going to carry in all the grant money I had in cash on my person, that's the only way I could figure out to do it, but my grants, I had two, and so they were in two chunks. I didn't have the second grant yet, and wouldn't for close to a year, but my license was only one round trip. It required me to work a full, you know, 40 hour week and so forth. And it wasn't set up for someone who was going to be there for over a year. And 
So I called Foreign Assets and I talked, to, back when you could talk to a body, a live person, I talked to Jeff Browner, who some of you may know, or I may have known. And he said, no, no, just one trip, one trip, that's it. And I said, well, uh, you know, how, how am I going to get my second part of my grant? And he said, I don't know, I don't know. Well, I said, and not only that, don't I get, if I'm working a normal American work week, 40 hours a week, don't I get two weeks of vacation <laughs> And he said, uh, you know, if you need to, just, just we'll, we'll work it out. This, this is the longest license I've ever seen. So my next step was thinking, well, maybe I should, since I'm licensed, maybe I should uh, investigate um, uh, getting money wired to Cuba, which was, turned out to be a bad idea. I had my, my parents uh, call their local bank in New Mexico, and the next day they got a call from the Treasury Department threatening them with, you know, $50,000 fine and 10 years in jail and so forth. So the, 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 even the golden age was still frustrating and frankly it was frustrating on both sides as, as everyone has sort of mentioned or a lot of these stories. The Cuban side was also difficult. I, I arrived in a sense the beneficiary of track two but when one government says yes the other one is going to say uh, no wait a minute. So uh, the Cubans had, they, were, they rescinded the affiliation I was supposed to have which was at the uh, Center for African and Middle Eastern Studies, and so I affiliated instead as a graduate student, got a student visa for the next year and a half at the University of Havana. I did a, a took classes in a master's program in the Department of History, uh, Modern History, did a master's in uh, Caribbean and Cuban studies. So it worked out in the end, but I th think here one is always sort of in, uh, again, as Lou said, every six months there's a change, and I think th there are just cycles of uh, uh, response and counter response between the two governments. One needs to eventually just be comfortable do, working with that and, and having a backup plan and a backup to your backup plan and a backup to that plan as well because if you're persistent enough you will probably be able to figure it out. But uh, hopefully the, this current administration is now facing some headwinds and we'll see uh, some relaxing of the U.S. side uh, pretty soon. Well, my stories are less dramatic than anything that, that you have said. And I, I don't know if it's perhaps because of my um, Catholic school girl face that I just <laughs> get into, into problems, you know, or if perhaps there's other reasons there. Um, Alan said that, that, um, that everybody's an anthropologist here except myself. Um, I, I work on literature. And, and I, I really think that, that, that these disciplines have, uh, the, this, the discipline in which one works also uh, faces different kind of problems. Uh, in front of this intractability that is, that is the environment. I started working on, on Cuban material for my, for my PhD. Um, and I, was, I wrote a, a dissertation on the relationship between biographical writing and, and national, the formation of national identity in Cuba during the 19th century. Um, and I was able to do that dissertation without having to travel to Cuba, you know, just with pure um, li uh, library, uh, library material you know, from, from the university where I was studying. So I think that, that, that at that time, uh, literary studies was still very much in the model of structuralism, post-structuralism, deconstruction, very kind of like textually centered. And the expectation that in order to do uh, 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 textual analysis, the expectation that you will, uh, you will uh, need to do field work or go abroad was not part of your disciplinary training. No? Um, so uh, when I went to Cuba, basically I, I wrote my dissertation and managed to write actually a book that came out from that dissertation without having to go to Cuba. No? Now, there, has been, there was a shift in, 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 in literary studies, I think, um, and in general in the humanities, I would say in the late 80s, the way of the construction, uh, the, the, the kind of complication, the emergence of cultural studies and the idea that, that you can't study literature, uh, or, or perhaps you still can, but there was kind of like a different expectation that also literary study required archival research, that we needed to kind of like put literary text in communication with you know, other kind of like material that was not felt a necessity before. So between that and I think the opening, the, the emergence of certain forms of interdisciplinary work and transdisciplinary work um, connected to literary studies at the time. I started working on, uh, interested in, in visual material and our history. And I, that is the project that I'm working on right now. So we book on the cultures of slavery and 
what I'm looking at is about the, 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 the questions of subjectivity as these are manifested both in literary text but also in visual material. Now, the visual material is in Cuba, and all the material concerning visual material, the archive, the, the archive to kind of like dig out you know, the meaning of these works is in Cuba. So I go to Cuba actually in the, in the early 90s for the first time after having written a dissertation on Cuba without having had needed, needed to go to Cuba. So I think that for in still in literary studies, one can do those kind of things. And uh, perhaps the agony is, a, is of a different sort, ethical, political, more than, than, than the pressure that you cannot do it uh, if, you, if, you, if you travel. Um, uh, so I go in the, early, in the early 90s, and I just want to just tell you my first, my, the primal scene of my research in Cuba, just like an anecdote. Um, I go there, and I thought that I could take my American Express checks. <laughs> okay. So there I'm with my American Express checks. No? And what do I learn two days after I'm there? Is that American Express yeah. checks cannot be used in Cuba. Oh my god, I have a ticket for six weeks of research here, and I don't have money. And I have to say that I went, and again, as Shannon, there's names that we cannot name, because a lot of the, 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 the work that we can do in Cuba, I feel that, that it's, Lou said that is patient, persistence, passion. And I will say that there's an intangible that has to do with inter -human, human, human interactions. Uh, uh, passion, passion is a sense of, of personal commitment, you know? And again, I don't know if it's because of my school, my Catholic girl's face, but I really have extraordinary friends in Cuba that have chip in when time has been needed. Uh, starting with this primal scene of not having money. I go, you know, ex -friend, this friend tells me, don't worry, I miss. This is, this is the peak of the special period, this is 1993. There's no food. There's no food for anyone in Cuba. And they tell me, don't worry about it. You are coming here, you're going to do your research. And you remember they had microje. They just like they, there was barely any food, so they would just like get rice and put extra water and excess of water, so that they could just like make it more. But they would just reduce the the, 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 the nutrients in it. They said, "Don't worry, we can do the arroz microje, and you're gonna do your research here." And thankfully, through some uh, kind of like subterfuges, I managed to. Cash the, the, the checks that you know, another friend of mine told me, Cuba is not lose those dollars. Cuba is not lose those dollars. But what I was completely moved at that moment is that all of a sudden I have established this friendly relationship with people that were ready to go to bed to allow me to do my research. Then after that, I didn't go for many years to Cuba, and I've gone back again most recently because I'm kind of like taking on this project again. And I have to say that I don't know if it's because of those kind of like foundational moments, but every time I go there, I've been there, yes, there's the bureaucracy and there's the dinosaurs that just feel that they, they have their territories in this office and you're not going to use it, but there's these pockets of solidarity that have worked very well for me. And I don't have a tragic story to tell, even though there's a tragedy, which is the ironic thing. So, I mean, I will leave it there. I just thought that perhaps I should also bring this in because it seems that there's these contingencies and these cracks that also take place. And it's within those contingencies and cracks that sometimes one's work can be done. But that was an equally dramatic story. If not, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it also points up the importance of informal flows as well. Mm -hmm. uh, as much as these bureaucratized exchanges, I mean, I think that's what I experienced in my first trip and my only regrettably trip to Cuba as the director of the center here. I waited for six months to get a specific license that eventually was granted. And uh, again, in that golden era, it wasn't so golden as Paul mentioned. There were a lot of problems on both ends, uh, moving around the country and getting there and then uh, again, uh, you know, I had the FBI come by and say, well, what was it you were really doing there? Uh, the typical thing.
thing. And of course, we all ignored that here. And I must say, the University of Chicago uh, comported itself well in terms of uh, backing those people down. And I think that is important uh, when that happens, because this is very arbitrary. It's all arbitrary in many respects. And uh, it isn't, uh, there may be an evil genius out there, but uh, there's a lot of this petty stuff going on on, on, on this side uh, as well. In any event, with that, um, thank you very much for everyone who was very succinct, brief, and gave it kind of a sense of what it's like to do research or try to do research uh, in Cuba. And I guess what we should do is if there's any questions or commentary uh, from everyone here, uh, either address it to, to panels or, or to express your own uh, experience to add to, to, to this knowledge base, would be great. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much. It was interesting. Um, my name is Joan Henley, and I'm a uh, research assistant professor at the University of Illinois School of Public Health. And I've been traveling back and forth to Cuba since 2000, 2000 actually. And being in the medical sciences rather than the, well, public health is a social science, but I think it's seen more and treated more as, as a medical science. And so I would support the um, proposition that there is variation in the disciplines in terms of the kinds of challenges and support and opportunities. We, my husband and I have really don't have a dramatic story to tell in terms of, of challenges. And we've always been sponsored by uh, clinical and public health folks there. And given the fact that Cuba really is an example, and as Mr. Smith pointed out, we, th there's a lot to be learned from Cuba as in other, other countries. I think the opportunity for public health folks and medical folks to bring home the success stories of what's happened in Cuba with the health system and other aspects of the social system there is something that they want us to be there and they, they facilitate and they encourage and just pull out all the stops to support what's needed to get manuscripts written to get, to get the word out. So I just wanted to share that, um, that experience. If you had any questions of me specifically, mm. I would answer what I, it was a very different uh, experience. Yeah, I had another commentary actually about disciplinary differences, which I also agree with. I, I originally thought that my, I might be here to represent science on this very um, a social science-y uh, uh, panel, although if you know my work, that's kind of funny because as archaeologists go, I'm not very science-y. However, um, ar archaeology, uh, but I think also a lot of the field sciences, uh, biology, uh, ecology, uh, geology, they all require equipment. Uh, they require often um, team support, staffing, and doing research uh, in Cuba uh, with the treasury rules is nearly impossible now that they're being very tightly enforced. Uh, even when you get the license, you are still prohibited from spending more than, I think is the latest $167 a day. Um, but if the expectation, I mean, in order to get your licenses there, you have to have a collaborative project with Cuban researchers established. They have the expectation that you're going to pay their staff, not that you, the rich American, are going to show up and have all of them work for you for free, right? Which is some kind of horrendous echo of, um, you know, 19th century American plantation economies for them. So it's extraordinarily difficult, and I have to launch true field projects now in Cuba. And I have anecdotes of friends who, in the last six months, have been uh, invest investigated by Treasury precisely for this, for bringing in money for uh, beyond the limits in order to pay for that. The other thing you should know is about equipment. It's now extremely difficult to bring laptops and uh, just really basic equipment for research. You can, it's very hard to bring laptops or uh, uh, digital cameras, or never mind specialized equipment that, as an archaeologist, I would use, like a laser theodolite or um, surveying equipment. Uh, so it's really shut down the kind of field sciences and large projects. And there are um, colleagues at the Field Museum in uh, both biology uh, and in archaeology who similarly their projects have been stymied and cut off. The difficulty for bringing in the laptops and all this on the US side? Yes, because they're considered uh, bartered materials. Uh, then in other words, if you leave them there for any time period whatsoever, or if there's a possibility that you're going to leave them there, you're contributing to the Cuban economy.
And, and also, I think there might be a clause about sharing technology. It's a technology thing as well. It's, it's Iran is yeah. the same thing as it yeah, it's, it's impossible to get laptops in, even though they're not exactly the most powerful right. things in the world, but that's what they're considered, their uh, banned technology. Uh, so. See, that's so interesting. I never had any problems. You've mm -hmm. never had any problems. Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> you might it, if you come back. Might, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as Lucy is capricious, so yeah. just be prepared mm -hmm. next time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the last time I was there was 2004. Mm. Well, I, was, I bought a computer down in 2006 for a friend of mine, a laptop, and basically what, through email, we were trying to figure out how, how it was best to do that because she was, you know, she's a, a, a respected intellectual in Cuba and whatnot. I was like, well, should we have a letter? Should we do this? Should we do that? And in the end, she asked people around and said, well, she emailed me, so this was on the email as well. Um, just say that it broke, if they asked, that it broke while you were down there. So that's what we ended up doing, and nobody, at, you know, I, it was, but it was me individually. I think if you go with the group or if you had some sort of different project, you have a lot of equipment that's different. But an individual person coming in with one laptop, I didn't bring mine. I just brought that one. Mm -hmm. And then I left it there, and there was no problem. But the backup story was that it broke. Whether I might have been, been hassled if I had been questioned, that's totally possible, you know, you never know, it's part of it. So that's the story from research is to always have backup stories, the back story, <laughs> <laughs> the real and the unreal, okay, well, why not? That was 2006, that was <laughs> But there is this issue also that if, they, if in, in the Cuban authorities in the airport feel that you're bringing that mm -hmm. as a present for someone, you have to pay some, you have had that experience, yeah, no? taxes. Ta yeah, yeah, taxes. you have to pay a hundred percent tax mm. on the Cuban mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Presence if you, if you declare them as such. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, I, I think if you bring electronics in, they'll make you sign something that you'll probably take them back. Take it back. It's like a visa for the electronics, mm -hmm. right? So it's complicated on both ends. And, it, you know, the, the controls in Miami are not stringent. I mean, I've, I've never had uh, anybody look through my baggage in Miami leaving the United States, but. Uh, yeah, but it could happen. From the point of entry, in Chicago, I get searched every time, and they have to call the supervisor down and look at my license and look at the. It just mm -hmm. depends, I think, on where. Miami, they're so busy they can't. And and they know what it's you know they know yeah, what a license looks like yeah. you know and what you know what kind of you know, people who carry such licenses are and you know, so it might make that make it easier. Exactly. Thousands of people. If you come through Chicago, if you come through Houston, you're an oddity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Those were kind of cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Frontline people have no idea what the license was, the conditions were, and always had to do a supervisor who had no idea. Just like as an anthropologist, I kind of get a kick out of it because yeah, it's, it's for me, I, I allow an extra hour at that end because I know I'm going to get redlined and I'm going to get questioned. And I mm -hmm. kind of, I, each, you know, the potential terrorist thing was a new one. That was, that mm -hmm. was the latest. And so, as long as you're legal, I think that, you know, for me well, being legal and going in, I think, well, okay, let's see what they're going to hit me with. And I learned about the policy, changes to the policy, at least on the U.S. side, through how I get treated when I... You're right, you're more legal, you have to spend the cash. You don't have to spend the cash. And so, you know, if they keep you, you know, you've got, you know, an hour and a half later, they question you, you can just fly. I'm partly kidding. Yeah, and the additional, maybe the other tip is, you know, if anybody can go on an institutional license, it's the better deal, because uh, it. Yeah, I mean, the the purpose of the individual travelers, you know, uh, going to Cuba cannot be questioned in the same way that if you go on a general license where you have no paperwork whatsoever, all you sign is a travel affidavit that you're going to do, for example, full time research with a high likelihood of publication. That's, and that's, you know, that you deposit with the travel agent, basically. So, so once you enter, uh, technically, uh, anybody could question the 
legitimacy of your trip, they could just basically say, well, we saw you at the beach. <laughs> Hang out uh, and you know, not do full-time research. You're doing ethnography of the beach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When I come back to Miami, I look at, I look at the uh, customs of okay, so this is citizen. I'm looking at the person who I believe most looks like an Anglo American. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. Got a friend of mine who takes a piece and says, I want to find someone who's African American. Okay? Because that's the person who he thinks is going to be less hostile. And so when he's a little fine calibration that one makes, so all the other things that you've learned over the years, how do you get back in to try to minimize that? That's what the back was, that's what I hate to do, but I think I think the guy just the front desk and said, just to go out my life. Okay, I'm on the line, there's a change of shit. And the woman comes in and she could have been calling around and put it all out. And she was fine. She was fine. I don't know if you look at her. from I.O. because I figure they're going to be the ones that, they're the ones that say, so what were you doing in Cuba? You know, what the American flag and patriotism means, don't defy, you know, that sort of thing. So those are the ones actually that I avoid. <laughs> Well, I, I would actually want to shift terms a little bit, I, maybe break protocol. Actually, I had a question of, of the first panelist that I didn't get to answer, ask. <laughs> so I, I hope I don't. <laughs> this, so this has to do with the politics of my you know, country that I have worked in for so long, uh, Bolivia and uh, Evo Morales and this, the emergence of uh, Chavez and, and the movement towards socialism and also all of that. And I was just curious of, of, of the Cuban specialists here. Uh, the extent to which there is uh, at all a kind of orientation towards Chavez. I mean, how seriously connected are there? It seems to me there's many conflicting interests from Venezuela, Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, uh, Cuba, uh, and, and I'm wondering in terms of the issue that maybe you were mentioning if the oil fields come in then this policy of the U.S. becomes irrelevant because there will be these obviously flows of capital that it, the U.S. in some sense can be work, it's a circuit, you're outside the circuit, you no longer need it in some sense, even though you're still threatened by it. I mean, do you think the, there is any kind of an emergent uh, alliance that actually strengthens this, or is this of convenience? <coughs> I mean, it strengthens the notion that, uh, like Chavez says, you, the U.S. is irrelevant, basically, you know, and, and, and Evo Morales says it's irrelevant to our needs, and they're pulling out of the World Bank just recently, uh, saying, you know, this is an irrelevant institution. I mean, is, there, do you, is that a kind of a serious sense in, uh, in your feeling, that this is a kind of a a movement, a feeling that there isn't other forms of solidarity and we don't really need to, to be that concerned with the capital flows out of the Anglo-American side? Look, I, I think that uh, U.S. standing in Latin America has never been so low. Uh, Castro has survived, as I was saying earlier, everything that we've thrown at him and come out of it uh, uh, doing well. I, I mean, physically, he may not be. <laughs> politically uh, doing well. And uh, we've got Evo Morales and Chavez, and yes, this alliance, the relationship uh, between Cuba and Venezuela, I think, is very important. And Ecuador now going, and uh, Argentina, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Lula in Brazil, and more modern, but even there, I mean, uh, there's a good relationship with Cuba, fairly good relationship uh, with Chavez. Everything is moving against us uh, in, in Latin America at this point. Well, not everything, but the general trend is against us in Latin America, and I don't think that that, uh, that, that will end uh, even with the election of a new, of a new president. I mean, we've lost too much ground. And I, saying that you talk to Cubans now, and, uh, there was a time when they weren't going to cave into this, but they did value, they saw a real value in uh, renewed relations. Uh, at this point, yeah, they like that, it's, it's fine, but it's, it's 
not anything now that we kind of anything like the, the importance that uh, that it once was. Not to get into an argument with Lou, I don't agree on uh, the U.S. invading if they strike oil. I I might have been worried about that uh, some years ago, but at this point, uh, given what's happened in Iraq and the rejection on the part of the American people of this kind of approach to things. I don't think that uh, that will happen as they bring in that oil field in Cuba. I think American public opinion would be too strongly uh, against it. American <coughs> oil companies will be pressing in the other direction to get in, to get in and start drilling in, in, uh, in Cuban waters. So I. I, I understand where Lou's coming from on that, and I had some concerns on that score myself some years back, but not anymore. And I think if the oil field uh, comes in and simply really just points up uh, the, the vacuity of U.S. policy, I mean, here we are, standing to one side while Cuba becomes a major oil producer. That would be the irony, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> wouldn't, wouldn't you have anxiety then over having two powerful oil producing countries, Venezuela and of course Bolivia with his gas, which yeah. it needs to get out somehow, but as a sort of a nexus of natural resources that then would cause great anxiety potentially politically in the, in the U.S. Uh, yeah. given our current uh, energy policies. So I'm wondering how you know, in other words, that's why I actually was raising yeah. the question of potential alliance with Chavez and this sort of oil uh, yeah, and also cartel. An American move against Cuba in those circumstances would really cause a reaction throughout Latin America. Well, I believe, yeah, it would be yeah. very painful for us. Right. The only other way is that uh, the household across the island, which is moving, moving is quiet that Chavez is killed, and it's the Chavez, Chavez is the you know, the two five women, the shit is the family over again. Right? And the idea that this is contingent on one guy. Mm -hmm. you know, right, right. Who's a brilliant black man, creates a tremendous amount of just quiet, Here. I was wondering, with your experience being between academics and the Beltway, uh, how much sway do academics have in Washington? Is there anything that we can effectively do? And, and do we have your email right Such there? Okay. <laughs> um, so there is your law case. But uh, do you, even your court case, um, I mean, I guess I, I certainly sense, I mean, Lori's kind of commented that it seemed like this was a very kind of self indulgent conversation on, on the one hand, I, I am sympathetic to that. On the other hand, sometimes I feel like we are irrelevant to, to politics and uh, have been marginalized. And I'm wondering, it seems like you've been someone who's actually been able to go back and forth between real politics and, and academics. And I wondered if you had any insight on the role of academics in uh, Washington. Well, I think if academics can uh, organize, band together, uh, make their voices, heard in a unified way, they can have impact, but uh, uh, that's difficult, <laughs> it seems to be very difficult for academics to, uh, to do. And I think, again, I'm so disappointed that no college or university signed on to this can I ask you, in terms of individual <coughs> academics, I mean, what is at stake? Obviously, people are worried about what would happen to their employment or what would happen, you know, I mean, they're worried about the repercussions. No, I'm talking about the universities. Right, but I'm wondering but about the, individuals. The academic side, as individuals, the professors, fine, they, they do. But the universities, they're afraid of losing federal funding or, you know, offending the 
federal government subway is going to cut into their, their grants. It's also a fear uh, of losing the license. Mm -hmm. That has For been example, a, a something that we have discussed here. Yeah. Is it also true, I mean, that there are fewer and fewer general licenses being granted to academic institutions? Fewer general licenses being granted? This was sort of a rumor that was circulating, and I was wondering if it fewer licenses. General licenses yeah. to academic institutional institutions. Institutional licenses. Yeah, well, the general license for research is, you know, yeah. they, it's there. You might have to even apply for it. Mm. No, she means the institutional. 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 I meant spoke. What? The institutional license. She means for institutions so that any of their students may go using yeah. the institutional license. Are yeah. there fewer of those? Uh, I don't know whether there are fewer or not. We still have one. Hopkins has a license. We still have one. Uh, the no. dean insists on applying every year. I, I was against it. I said we shouldn't. We should send in and say under these circumstances we will not apply for a license. Uh, but the dean insists that we do. And so it's renewed every year. We don't use it. But it's there. Well, yeah, we, a couple of professors have traveled down, and they, they can. But uh, most of we don't use it for students. But my understanding is that in recent years, some schools have lost their, <coughs> their licenses, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. University of Arizona, I think, yeah. was one of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and uh, quite a few just haven't renewed them, right? They're not taking students down. Why, why was that? Why did Arizona lose the license? Why, why did Arizona lose the license? I don't, I don't know. Do you? They don't renew. They don't renew. Yeah. I mean, so dealing with OFAC, can we get to people? We have found ways, we have found numbers that we could actually get a place in the world. We got questions related to study abroad, how do we pay faculty, just the, the complexity of dealing with the program. Cuba, you cannot be risk averse, uh, and uh, it, does, it does go on, though. Uh, I mean, we do have uh, anthropologists here, people that I know, certainly from the University of Chicago, who will be going, so of course we all know that these exchanges uh, are continuing, and we only hope that we can kind of make that connection much more dense, and through both informal and formal means, but um, so rather than hopefully not take an apocalyptic view of it, uh, that uh, there will be change, as, as has been expressed here, we hope in the next uh, couple of years, and, and that we can perhaps maintain some continuity. That's what I saw when I was director here. It was very difficult. Again, the expectation is you get a license, and then it's taken away. And you can never, as you know, any academic, it's very difficult to plan research uh, if you never know. And it's, it's wonderful to have several backup plans, but it's very difficult for any graduate student to have three different dissertations in mind to go to Cuba and actually be able to mobilize and get any one of those uh, done. So it is very, very difficult. But uh, again, we hope that uh, we all take it forward and, and continue. Um, are there any uh, more commentary? This has been a very, very long and very fruitful sessions here. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're all appreciative of everyone uh, passion uh, and persistence. Uh, and in Josh, if I'm not mistaken, there is a reception at some point. I don't know if it's set up yet. It was supposed to be right around 7. Right around 7, yeah. Right around 7. So uh, if there's no other comments or questions here for panelists, uh, I think we can reconvene for convivial uh, uh, session and continue the conversation uh, at the reception. And thank you to our two distinguished panelists uh, again. Yeah.